So this really is one of the first, uh, one of the, the first in-person, uh, jointly in-person and online uh, meetings at the School of Arts uh, at SOAS since we got over the peak of the pandemic and it's a real thrill to be back um, in person and in this new um, hybrid format. And this kind of event exemplifies the research intensity of the School of Arts and of Southeast Asian studies at SOAS in where two particular areas of strength uh, overlap and intersect. And one of those is issues of heritage and restitution. And the other is Hindu Buddhist arts, archeology span and museology of Southeast Asia. And in addressing the histories and the restitution of ancient Indonesian objects, this event in particular further supports the really important SOAS agenda or initiative or imperative of our times, namely decolonizing. It also builds the event, this event, on a number of recent um, publications. And I'm going to name check a few because uh, they're important and they matter. Uh, Returning Southeast Asia's Past, edited by Panga Ardiansia and Louise Tithicott in the National University of Singapore Press Series, edited by my colleague, uh, my <laughs> other colleague, Ashley Thompson, and former colleague, uh, Pamela Corey. Uh, it builds on the doctoral work of Zuyan Yuan on sham art from temple sites in Vietnam. It builds on the work of Ashley Thompson and Seng Sanetra on Cambodia, recently reported on BBC networks. Uh, it builds on the work of our SAP alumni, Mia Sopheep and Wong Chan Reaksmi. Uh, um, and Sopheep's work was also highlighted in BBC reporting last week. And it builds on collaborations between my academic colleagues uh, in the School of Arts and in History of Art, together with colleagues in Southeast Asia on restitution, of which there is much more to come. And the School of Arts has made a big investment in making this event happening happen. And that fact, I think, demonstrates our continuing commitment to uh, at SOAS to international collaborations of this kind. Now, today's event takes place on the heels of some very important research news from last week. And in, in common justice to my amazing colleagues in the School of Arts, I, I must reflect for a moment on some of that news, um, specifically the results published last Thursday of the what's called the Research Excellence Framework, or REF, which is a census of research in the UK that happens about every seven years to measure the quality of uh, research in UK higher educations. And I'm really delighted to report that research across the arts at SOAS is really has been measured as going from strength to strength. Our colleagues in music edged up to being the third placed uh, department in the UK. Uh, History of art edged up to sixth out of 84 uh, departments with almost 60% of our research publications deemed in a category called world leading. Um, and the, our environment for research are judged to be absolutely fully um, world leading in first position with just three others, which is really quite a distinction. So I, please forgive me if I continue to crow about this, but um, it, I really do it to recognize the achievements of my, of my colleagues. Um, it must be done. And if we think about um, history of arts, world leading research environment. It is precisely this event and other events like it that make it so. And part of the strength here, I think, is the pathway that we endeavor to open up for our SARP scholars and our students and our alumni, pathways into the profession, into the museum, into the academy and into arts professions. And I think this event exemplifies that. Um, it's in that it is part of the established SARP CS, that's the Southeast Asian Art Academic Program, for those who possibly have been living under a rock and don't know what it stands for, and CS, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, research seminar series, which is currently co-convened by a group of SARP scholars and alumni. Now, I want to say a huge thank you to all of our international speakers who've traveled to London for this event, uh, some perhaps leaving their 
country for the first time in a number of years. A very special thank you to two of the Java based speakers who've made it their business to come in person when international travel, as we all know, uh, remains clearly a serious challenge. We appreciate it enormously and it will surely enrich the proceedings. Uh, so the day is fully recorded and the recordings will provide a valuable record uh, for SOAS teaching in the future. So let me finish by saying many congratulations to the organizing team, the volunteers, the conveners of the SARP CS research seminar. Uh, you have made it look effortless and I can't think of a better platform for a wonderful event. Okay, I guess it's my time now. So I'm Leslie Pullen, I'm the convener, um, and I welcome you all, Slama Pagi, for those of you somewhere across the world and for those of you who understand Indonesian. But the first thing I need to say is to thank my colleague Heidi Tan, who has stuck with me um, over the last few months, especially. But I want to tell you how this whole event started. And she and I got together. I raised the idea in back in 2018. It's a long time coming. But it really didn't come together until 2019. And it was first planned for the third term of the academic year of 2020. So you all were engaged at that at stage. And I was asked to employ speakers. And who was I going to ask? So they were people I knew. All of you that I've employed today, I knew, or I knew of you, or I knew your work or I was recommended to you, as in Karen, who came in late because we had a number of speakers pull out. So I really want to thank you all for staying with me and carrying on with this event and not publishing your work someone else. I presume you haven't done that, maybe you have, <laughs> but you're here and it means a lot to Heidi and I that we have virtually the same core group as when we started. So you might ask why Java? Because I've been asked that, why did we have a conference on Java? Well, the Manjushri statue here that's on the board here, is, which I will present on in panel two and forms the logo of this symposium, has always remained a mystery to me. And with little information was ever published on its exact whereabouts until um, 2016. Therefore, the idea of this symposium addressing Hindu Buddhist objects originating from Java, Sumatra and Bali was a subject close to my heart and something very little discussed. So biographies and restitution became the title from which I sought you all, our speakers. And now I have to say my few thank yous because this event couldn't happen without SARP and I'm not going to spell it all out because I'm sure you all know who that is now. And thank you Shane for, for being here and sponsoring the event and for Ashley, our two senior heads of department um, who will close up at the end of the day. But I'd also need to thank Nick Bernard and Stephen Murphy and Christian Luxenitz and Heidi Tan for agreeing to manage the four sections of today. And of course, all our volunteers who are so eminently dressed, giving you stickers and lunch menus, things that we never usually have at SOAS. And to Cyrus, um, a young man who has really organized this whole event with the signposts and all the papers everywhere. So we know what the event is like. Without the team, you can't get going. So just to briefly show you, your, our day is broken up into a number of sections. We will try to keep to time as best as possible. So I please do ask you to be back up from lunch or the breaks um, on time because we're online as well. Obviously we don't want to hold up the online speakers. So each speaker has 20 minutes and then hopefully 10 minutes for discussion and chat after each event and the discussants Panel leaders will sit here at the front. Um, unfortunately, we were hoping to have the big white screen, but it failed on us. So we have the computer screen. So some of the captions, some of you may not be able to read because they were designed for a big screen. Anyhow, so be it, we have to go with what we have. And as um, Shane has already said, one thing that is important with this event is to look at past publications. And he's already mentioned the Louise Tithicott and Pangas book, Returning Southeast Asia Past, but there were others that I want to highlight, and people who are here in the audience, uh, Marika Bloombergen, Pieter Tukuz, and Mirjam Hojnik, all these publications in the, just the last few years have discussed or touched on the subjects we'll be looking at today. But also what's come up recently, there was a post created called Provenance Research and Object Historian at the National Museum of Art, Washington, D.C., and that reflects a need to learn and understand the provenance of objects. 
this year at the ACM in Singapore hosted a book launch titled Raffles Revisited, Essays on Collection and Colonialism. Um, this was edited by Stephen Murphy, one of our own here. And it really looked at Stanford's Raffles impact. And one question posed was, why should we honor him? A change of view, perhaps. The Ateneo Veneta in Venice, another online conference called, why are we still looking for Nazi looted art in Italy? I intended this one at my home. This conference highlighted the importance of provenance and negotiated solutions in returning artworks. Then there was a third event earlier this year that I watched or listened to, and it was from the National Museum also of Asian Art, and it was titled Asian Art and the Third Reich. And it showed how Asian art objects were most popular forms of art collected in the early 20th century. And just a few weeks ago, the Indian Art Circle here in London hosted why does Tibetan art need decolonizing in memory of our beloved John Clark? In the early years of the 19th century, there were many players in the collecting and study of art objects. And I thought I'd share with you a few names. And I know Pieter, our keynote speaker, will elaborate further on this subject. One, Stanford Raffles, everybody's heard of Raffles, was the Lieutenant Governor General from 1811 to 16. And during his tenure, known as the British Interregnum, a large quantity of the statues were removed and shipped to the Netherlands and to Bengal. In Bengal, they were placed in the Indian Museum, founded by the Asiatic Society of Bengal in 1814. Another character, Colonel Colin McKenzie of the Madras Engineers, worked in Java under Raffles' governorship between 1811 and 13, taking accurate surveys of ruins and drawings and making sketches of Prambanan and other sites. Mackenzie was responsible for much of the activity in Bengal, where many antiquities were deposited and still remain today. I know Echo, our first speaker online, will talk about one of those briefly. Professor Caspar Reimwark was a journal national, was sent to and soon became chairman of the Batavia Sites of Art and Sciences under the British Interregnum. Um, the society was instrumental in accumulating knowledge about Javanese culture. And of course, last, um, Professor Caspar Ruvens, who was one of the modern Dutch scholars, and Nicholas Engelhard, who was part of the old guard, who was responsible for many of the sculptures that were removed from Singasari and Chandi Jago, uh, more in my paper later. Engelhard wrote to Ruvens and accused Raffles of plagiarism, suggesting Raffles claimed the glory of research for himself by not mentioning the original authors of the drawings. Furthermore, Engelhard contended that most of the charts and illustrations of temples and sculptures in the history of Java were his. Many uh, of these facts I think people don't really know. So I will conclude and hoping that this symposium will provide some insight into the sensitive issue of whether the restitution, in inverted commas, of ancient objects to Indonesia is any different from their restitution to other Asians in South and Southeast Asia. For instance, whilst it's clear that predominantly Hindu India is pressing for the restitution of the ancient Hindu objects, and predominantly Buddhist Cambodia is pressing for the return of their ancient Buddhist objects, is predominantly Muslim Indonesia pressing equally hard for the restitution of their ancient Hindu Buddhist objects? We can only acquire, does the predominant contemporary religion impact the political will invested in restitution by each national government and its agencies? especially when such ancient objects are clearly representing an other religion to their national religion. So on that note, I hope that subject comes up again. Um, I'll close and wish you all a great day. And I'll hit, hand you over to Nick Bernard, who's the great of South and Southeast Asia at the Victorian Outland Museum, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Nick, thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie, and, and, and um, many thanks to SARP and SEAS for, for uh, this conference. And to, to Leslie, thank you very much for inviting me to participate uh, today. Um, so it's going to be a, a, a pleasure um, and an honour this morning to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Peter Tankos, the Professor for Museums, Collections and Society at the Leiden University Centre for the Arts and Society, and also Professor of Material Culture at the Institute of Cultural Anthropology and Development Sociology at Leiden University. Um, he specializes in critical museum studies and the studies of material culture, was formerly the curator at the National Museum of Ethnology, focusing on the Indonesian collections, did field work in Papua New Guinea and in Indonesia in the 80s and 90s, and has created several exhibitions around the world. Uh, in the period 2003 to 9, which I think we're going to hear 
bit more about uh, this morning. Um, he concentrated on cooperation with museums uh, in insular Southeast Asia and researched the history of colonial collecting. Um, his research uh, concerns the role of museums collections in research, the practice of collecting, changes in material culture around 1800, also Dutch collecting in the Mediterranean and perceptions of antiquities in the Netherlands, and therefore with publications on a very wide range of subjects in all these fields. Um, so if I may um, invite up um, Professor de Kurs to um, uh, give this keynote speech, which I think will be um, extremely pertinent to the kind of issues that we are um, discussing and thinking about today. So thank you very much. Well, I would like to start by thanking the organizers, Leslie and Heidi, and the whole group for inviting me. Uh, that was about three years ago, I think you, yes. you, you, you talked about it for the first time. And I have to confess that um, I had my doubts at the time, um, because I think I told you I haven't been in uh, Southeast Asia since 2009. So that means I don't have uh, a lot of recent information. I didn't do any recent field work there. So I thought, am I the right speaker here? Uh, but of course you convinced me that I should come anyhow. Uh, and maybe it's also good. It was anyhow good for me to get back to my old uh, material and with a distance in time to have also a bit more reflection on what we did uh, particularly in that period between 2003 and 2009, when Nick was already re referring to. Um, so uh, I am happy that I'm here. So that's, that's, uh, let that be clear. And let me take a relatively random point of uh, departure for my lecture. Um, as you know, the Indonesian-Dutch uh, relationship has had its ups and downs, to, to say the least. I will not summarize the whole colonial and post-colonial history because uh, I think for you, the sensitivities will be clear enough the moment I describe certain events. Around the mid 1990s, the relationship between Indonesia and the Netherlands was not at its best. The Dutch Min uh, Minister for Development Cooperation, Jan Pong, repeatedly asked attention for the human rights situation in Indonesia and in East Timor. And of course, the Indonesian government was furious. A former colonizer cannot reprimand its former colony on human rights issues. However well intended these remarks may, may have been. And this t tension between the two countries was clearly noticeable at the official diplomatic level, much less among mu uh, museum colleagues. That was much more uh, relaxed at the time. But at the time, I was involved in several uh, negotiations for loans. Um, and the moment high civil servants of Indonesian ministries were involved in these negotiations, the first question they always asked me, how is your relation with Minister Pong? So that was clearly a moment to put some pressure on the negotiations, maybe to, to insert some extra difficulties. So it was clearly an issue uh, in the mid 1990s. So in, um, in 1995, Indonesia celebrated uh, 50 years of independence with a large exhibition in Germany, at that time in Hildesheim. Maybe some of you may remember that uh, magnificent exhibition, and uh, not with an exhibition in the Netherlands. That was a clear statement, although the exhibition in Hildesheim had a lot of Dutch loans, loans from Dutch mu museums. In that same year, the Dutch government made again an inexcusable blunder, they sent the queen to Indonesia a few days after the independence celebration. So she was not there during the celebrations. And that was in the eyes of many people, an enormous mistake. And we've heard it for years. But in 2002, so I'm skipping a bit uh, in, in time. In, two, in 2002, it was clear that the uh, 60th anniversary of the independence in 2005 would again be a great event. And the Dutch government had to come up with a policy on how to deal with these sensitive issues. 
after really long and complex discussions, it was accepted by the ministries of both foreign affairs and education and culture that cultural cooperation would be an important key for normalizing the relations. So a year later already, we started the project Shared Cultural Heritage, Barison Budaya Bersama, with a, 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 a clear focus on research on colonial collecting, comparing the collections of Jakarta and Leiden, and uh, with the aim of creating two large exhibitions in 2005, one in Jakarta and one in Amsterdam. So we had only two years, uh, in fact, a little bit less to pre uh, prepare all that. But I will come back to this at the end of the lecture. I just want you to keep it in mind. And I will first address some important issues in the uh, collecting history of Hindu Buddhist remains in Indonesia. Some of it has already been mentioned by Leslie, but I will maybe take a slightly different view angle. Uh, since the second half of the 16th century, Hindu Buddhism was marginalized. Of course, you, you all know that in Indonesia. On Java, only a few pockets remained in the West and in the East. And of course, the island of Bali never converted to the new uh, religion, to Islam. It is most likely, however, that the decline of the Majapahit Empire does not coincide entirely with the decline of Hindu Buddhist mon uh, monuments. Many of the stone monuments probably were already in a bad shape at that time. The neglect and lack of maintenance of the sometimes spectacular and solid stone monuments, stone temples, must have started much earlier than that period and was probably well underway already in the 17th century. The Buddhist, the Hindu Buddhist empires were notoriously unstable. They were temporarily extremely powerful, being able to build the Borobudur and the Parmadan complex, for instance, but these periods never lasted long. So how do you maintain these enormous stone buildings uh, without the political structure and without the resources to organize it? Some temples, such as the temple, the main temple of Singasari, was never finalized, was never finished. And most were not well maintained after the builders had disappeared from the political landscape. We can assume that the spectacular central Javanese temples of the 8th and the 9th century and even the 13th century Singasari temples were already in decline by the time the, the Europeans arrived. During the 17th and the 18th century, particularly the 18th century, some officers of the Dutch East Indies Company, the VOC, were well aware of the importance of Hindu. Uh, yeah, that's the one I had to show earlier. Uh, this is already a later. Um, uh, painting by Sieber, this is, this is from 1840, and then already part of the building was already cleaned, uh, but it must have looked even worse. This is the, the famous Singasari temple. By, um, well, there were some, there were some VOC uh, servants who were very well aware of the importance of the, the Hindu Buddhist remains, on, particularly on Java. Uh, and they collected as individual antiquarians, not on behalf of institutions, not on behalf of the government. But this interest in ancient uh, remains, who were at the time actually not so ancient as they thought, um, was of course limited. I mean, earning money by monopolizing trade was of course the main occup occupation of, of the company. But of course, a major step was taken in uh, 1778 uh, when the, the Dutch VOC employee Jacobus Radermacher founded with some colleagues the Batavian Society for Arts and Sciences. In his own words, oh, I see I, I wrote it in, in Old Dutch, so I have to translate it a bit for you. <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, uh, in his own words, he wants to bring together um, uh, an aanzienlijk, uh, a group of people with certain status and knowledge uh, to try together um, and to do 
all the attempts to uh, stimulate and to elevate uh, the arts, the crafts, and uh, all that sort of things in uh, Batavia, and also, he says, in the other re regions of the East. So it was a rather vague uh, statement to start with, but um, that was the start of the Batavian society. And in the beginning, this society did not re receive approval or support from the official authorities of the company. They were just not interested and probably afraid that sooner or later they had to pay for it. Yeah, but the ideas of Radermacher and his colleagues uh, were very much inspired by Enlightenment thought and uh, were also inspired by the many scholarly so societies in 18th century Europe. Um, these ideas prevailed finally. In the first decades, um, it was actually very difficult for the Batavian society. It even had to be revived by Raffles, as you know. Um, but then a major change occurred around, around that, that time, around the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, collecting activity showed a shift from private individual initiatives to active involvement of the nation state a development that occurs in other parts of the world as well at the same time. But it is, of course, the start of 19th century nationalism. In the beginning of the 19th century, the VOC uh, property was formally uh, transferred to the Dutch state and Indonesia became officially a colony. This new situation led to collecting activities in which the state played more and more a central role. This is clearly illustrated with the example that was already mentioned also by Leslie of Nico Nicolaas Engelhardt. This Nicolaas Engelhardt was originally a VOC officer who collected Hindu Buddhist statues, put them in his garden in Sumarang, and um, to be uh, admired by uh, the guests he had. However, since uh, Engelhardt was now uh, no longer a VOC servant, but a servant of the state, of the Dutch uh, colonial state, he had less freedom after 1800 than before. After the Napoleonic Wars, the Dutch slowly intensified their grip on the colony, and they also started attempts to control collecting activities. So someone like uh, Engelhardt was approached by the colonial government with requests to transfer his antiquities that were no longer seen as his, but owned by the state to the Batavian society. And these people like Engelhardt, they were actually, they were actually uh, criticized uh, by the authorities very openly, not for taking these statues out of the temples, but for keeping them for themselves. From now on, they were urged to transfer the object to state institutions, particularly to the Batavian society. <laughs> Here we have Engelhardt. And, um, and the idea was uh, that the local population no longer felt any relationship with the Hindu Buddhist remains, since they had now all, uh, at least most of them, converted to uh, Islam. And therefore the statues could best be taken care of in a European type museum. In reality, it is of course not as simple as that. I'll come back to this point later. From 18, the 1820s onwards, the Hindu-Buddhist material remains uh, regularly found their way to uh, Dutch collections, particularly the National Museum of uh, Antiquities. So not the Museum of uh, Ethnology, where they are now, but the Museum of Antiquities. I have to tell you a, sm a small story in between. In 2009, when I changed job from the Museum of Ethnology to the Museum of Antiquities, the di uh, director looked at me in a kind of shock and saying, uh, but you're not going to get the Hindu Buddhist collection to bring to the Museum of Antiquities. So you can imagine a bit of competition that must have been there, particularly in the 19th century. Um, two persons um, 
were instrumental in um, in the stimulating this new flow of objects from Indonesia to uh, both the Batavian society as well as the uh, the museum in Leiden. And these are Reinwart, Professor Reinwart. There's now the Reinwart Academy in Amsterdam where museum professionals are trained. And Professor Kaspar Reuvens, the first director of the Museum of Antiquities in Leiden. And it goes far beyond uh, the scope of this paper to, to describe the importance of these two persons in details, in detail, but just a few remarks to, to sketch the context of uh, collecting in that period. Reinwart was sent to the newly acquired colony by the king because the king wanted to stimulate scientific research. He wanted to have more knowledge about, uh, that was the idea, more knowledge about the colony. Uh, as well as for collecting activities. And it was in this period that the authorities started to reprimand the 18th century antiquarians for keeping the collections for themselves, and really the beginning of the 19th century. As a result, uh, Hindu Buddhist statues, bronze objects and, and architectural uh, elements more and more found their way to the Netherlands. Reuvens was a young, and he died also young, he died when he was 42. Reuvens was the young and dynamic uh, director of the National Museum of Ant Antiquities, who, due to his extensive network, could secure collections from Leiden. So this was the period that the Singasari statues came to Leiden, around 1820 and some, some a bit later. For uh, Leuvens, the Museum of Antiquities was the most logical place for these statues since, and here we come again with that same argument, they came from a dead culture. The local people didn't have any relation with uh, the objects. So um, it was clear that they should go to a museum of uh, antiquities and not to the cabinet of rarities that was still existing at the time. And also not to what was later founded, the Museum of Ethnology. Important changes in policies occurred um, in 1840 and 1842, when it was first stipulated by the colonial government that no private persons um, were to consider antiquities as their own property, that no antiquity was allowed to leave Java without the consent of the governor general. But if the governor general would consent to it, it had only to be sent to the Netherlands, not to any other European country. In 1842, and that is a uh, remarkable, I think, <laughs> sorry, uh, this was followed by a decree stating that severe disappro disapproval for the removal of antiquities from their original location. So the government started to have a kind of awareness of the other aspects of uh, taking uh, these objects from the original location, also the, the local uh, attachment to these objects that may still uh, exist. Shortly after uh, came an appeal to the residenten, the, 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 the colonial officers who ruled a certain area, to protect local antiquities. And the president of the Batavian society was invited to make a list of antiquities for the society's collection without offending the conceptions and institutions of the Japanese people. So there was already quite a, quite a consciousness of also how important it was to keep that in mind. It's only after these new guidelines that the Batavian society could start to collect more Hindu Buddhist remains a development that would strengthen the society's collections finally up to a level that would surpass the Dutch collections, both in quality and in quantity. A major exception being, of course, the Singasari statues, because they were collected before the 1840 decree. So you really see, see important changes in that period. So the respect for local Javanese ideas concerning their own heritage was already clearly present in the official policies of the colonial administration. In reality, things were, of course, not as they seemed to be. The official guidelines were regularly avoided, 
and the trade in ancient objects could not be completely controlled. Also, because the local elite collected Hindu, Hindu Buddhist objects. Of course, they didn't want to offend the local elite in, in intervening there. By that time, uh, Reuven's was all, already dead, uh, and his plan to build, build an entirely new museum, here you see his own sketch, uh, with the Hindu Buddhist collection at the center of attention, as main center of attraction, his, this plan never materialized. Under Reuven's successor, and this is a, a print from around 1840, under Reuven's successor, Konrad uh, Lehmanns, a regular flow of Hindu Buddhist objects arrived at the museum in Leiden. But one can argue that it was never in great quantities at the same time, and also very, no, mostly not of the same quality as the Singasari statues. One more regulation should be mentioned. But this is uh, the, the only uh, picture, or the only print we have from the Hindu Buddhist display in the Museum of Antiquities in, in around the 1840s. And you can really re recognize uh, the statues, uh, the Nandi van Singhasari, the, uh, the Ganesha, the Pratyaparamita, the Temple Guard, uh, Nandishwara. It's really uh, clear that they were all there. Uh, one more regulation should should be mentioned. I don't know how far I am in the time. Uh, another, another five, ten okay, that's all right. Yeah. In 1862, uh, Lehmanns, uh, by that time he was also a director of the Museum of Ethnology, um, succeeded to convince the colonial government to implement a law that stipulated that every collector in the Dutch East Indies was obliged to send the objects to the Batavian society where the board would decide which part of the collection would be sent to the Netherlands and which part would stay in the East Indies. Lehman made this proposal to strengthen the collections of the Ethnology Museum in Leiden, but the result was that many of the best objects stayed in the Museum of the Batavian Society, now the National Museum of Indonesia. The board of the society consisted of Dutch people who lived a lifetime in the Dutch East Indies, and they had no intention to send the best pieces to, to the Netherlands. Seeing Dutch Indonesian scholars as armchair anthropologists, uh, armchair scholars, far removed from actual Indonesian cultural practices. I cannot summarize the two centuries of uh, collecting, so I'll have to skip some, some things. Um, it was uh, by the time that Konrad Lehmanns left the mu museum, uh, he stayed, he remained the director for 52 years, you can imagine. Uh, but, but by that time, so then we are in the end of the 19th century, the discussion on where to store and present Hindu Buddhist collections had been in the air already for decades. Some wanted it in the Museum of Antiquities, others wanted it in the Museum of Ethnology. Reuvens and Lehmanns were both very clear so-called dead cultures should be represented in the Indonesian, in the Museum of Ant Antiquities. And um, Hindu Buddhism was supposed to be dead. However, both Reuvens and Lehmann should have known better. Uh, actually, Reuvens all, already made remarks like, uh, well, uh, it's maybe not as simple as that. Even in early 19th century sources, uh, we can note that local views and practices around the Hindu Buddhist remains were still uh, alive. One of the best known examples is, of course, the Prata Paramita, eh, that represents not only, um, not only a Buddhist figure, but according to the local population, also Kendedes, the first queen of Sing Singasari. So apparently, the statue had not lost its meaning the moment it was co collected. Um, and uh, you can wonder whether it's morally acceptable that, that such a statue that's still important for the local population uh, is taken away from its context. To create a clear distinction between the two museums in Leiden, eh, the artificial difference between dead and alive, dead cultures and alive, 
that may have served well in mu mu museum politics, but it did not help to get a clear picture on how the Hindu Buddhist objects were actually treated and appreciated by the local population. And I think this is an important point, particularly also for restitution matters. To give one more example of local entanglement uh, with the Hindu Buddhist remains, and I use an example that's already used by Pauline Dunsing Schoerler in her uh, article of 2007, and I cite her, the Batavian society did at least sometimes adhere to its own condition about keeping the interest of the local population in mind. As appears from the refusal of the resident of Kediri in 1851 to send sculptures standing in his garden to Batavia, because it would strike the population very unpleasantly, as in its superstition, it is firmly attached to them, and it would imagine that the loss of the antiquities would also cause it to lose some of its luck. So they were allowed to keep the statues in Kediri. Actually, when one reads the minutes of the Batavian society or the reports of the archaeological service, there are many more similar examples to find. And in a few weeks, there will be an article published by the Leiden researcher Arthur Kruk, who will focus particularly on the period in 1910, 1920, when not only um, the interest, um, well, when, when there was a great interest in uh, restoring the monuments and the restorations that the Dutch restorers wanted to propose was not always in line with what the local population wanted. And there are even examples that certain temples were restored and that a year later they came back to inspect and the local population had completely destroyed the restorations because they said the spirits of the temple can't move freely when you when you block them with a, with a wall that may have been there originally, but that was not, you know, so there are, when you look for it, there are many more examples to find. Well, the Hindu Buddhist collection was transferred to the Museum of Ethnology in 1903, finally. By the end of the 19th century, the museums had shifted from a more universal history of, man, of mankind, of humanity, to a more particular history. The, the, the objects were no longer supposed to represent a universal history of humanity, as Reuven's and Lehmann's advocated, but the uniqueness of each culture. So everything that was considered part of the origin of Europe, Egypt, Greek, Roman, stayed in the Museum of Antiquities and all the non-Western things went to the Museum of Ethnology. Also the Central and South American antiquities moved to the Museum of Ethnology. To finalize, um, I skip a bit the point on the restitution of the Patnaparamita and the Lombok treasure, because I think that's all very well known and we can discuss that uh, in, the, um, in the discussions later on. I will finalize with coming back to the cooperation of 2003-2009. As I mentioned, in 1862, Lehmanns succeeded to convince the colonial authorities to send more objects to the museum in Leiden. And the selection was done by the board of the Batavian Society. Much of the collected material stayed in the colony and became part of what is now the National Museum. But this regulation of 1862 was the starting point of our cooperation project in 2003. So in that year, we started the Shared Cultural Heritage Program uh, with a lot of attention for uh, research into the collect collecting history and mutual loans were realized for high profile exhibitions in Jakarta and in Amsterdam. And uh, on the 18th of August 2005, the day after the independence celebrations, we opened the exhibition in ja Jakarta which included most of the Singasari statues that are in Leiden. We, uh, uh, that was a re really a big event. There was a lot of uh, resistance also among po politicians. But we think if we really want to show uh, uh, that we want to take the cooperation ser seriously, we really have to do something seriously also. So we lent out most of the Singasari statues. Um, 
And during the opening, when the Indonesian president uh, Suduyono and the Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs Bernard Bott entered the museum to open the exhibition, there were about three, uh, 300 people there. The Indonesian president started his speech with the word, it's the first time that the Dutch minister is present at the celebration of Indonesia's independence. And everybody stood up and erupted in a very long standing ovation. So you can imagine that we really had the feeling that, well, finally, uh, culture helps a bit to, to improve the relations. It was also during our product project that it became clear that the local voice on heritage and ownership of objects until then had been largely ignored. At the end of the first phase of the project, some staff members of the National Museum in Jakarta planned fieldwork in areas where contested heritage was an issue. Some were very successful in their research, but unfortunately none of them succeeded to publish their results in an English language journal. So let me conclude by stating that discussions on collection care, property rights, and, and restitution cannot be held without ample attention for local views, the views of the people where the objects originally come from. The Pratnya Paramita did not go back to Malang or to, this, to one of the sites in Singasari. It went back to the national collection in Jakarta. The Lombok treasure went back not went not back to Lombok. And we know from the fieldwork at that period that the people of Lombok didn't like that. So there's a, there's a fundamental tension there. The view of the local people is very important. That's not an easy task to, to make steps further in this di direction. We need much more research. And in many countries of the world, I didn't only work in, in the Indonesia, the national authorities do not automatically serve the interest of their their own, their own people or their own minority groups, they are usually not very keen on activating local feelings of uh, identity. So the story is, this was, the story is to be continued, hopefully partly uh, with the discussion here. This is an, uh, oh sorry, the other slide was a photo of the exhibition in Amsterdam. 2005. Thank you for your attention. Everyone hear me? Yes, good, that's working. Thank you very much. That was a really uh, rich and illuminating uh, discussion of, of, of this subject and, and with many different facets to it, I think. Um, it, starting with the, the ways that Hindu Buddhist antiquities were collected in Java in the 19th century, uh, moving through the return of certain objects to the late 1970s and the new phase of cooperation from 2003. I think it's interesting the way that you situated those in this political context. Um, the Another interesting strand, I think, is the way that you've made it clear that the 19th century collecting practices were by no means uniform, but they experienced important changes over time from the individual collecting activities in the 17th and 18th century of the employees of the VOC to the establishment of the Batavian Society for Arts and Sciences in 1778, but then from the early 19th century, the involvement um, of the Dutch state. Um, and this fascinating story about Nicolaus uh, Engelhardt uh, taking the statues from Singasari to decorate his garden and the way that that was became criticized not for removing the statues from their place of origin but for not uh, but for him keeping them in his own possession I thought that that was very um, uh, re re revealing. And then this process from the 1820s of sending uh, those, including the Singasari statues, uh, important objects to Amsterdam, to, to Leiden and the, and the Netherlands, uh, to the National Museum of Antiquities. And then change, the situation changing quite fundamentally again from 1840 to 42, um, when um, 
uh, the, there was um, uh, uh, regulation against the private owning of antiquities, but also uh, against exporting them without the consent of the, the governor general. And even from this point, I, if I understand correctly, the removal of antiquities from their original location was now frowned upon. So there's quite a, a big change at, at, at that point in time. And I thought it was fascinating also that you uh, referred to the, the Batavian Society um, after the 1840s, keeping really the best and the majority of objects in Java uh, and, and not wanting them to go to the Netherlands where they feel they may be only discussed by armchair scholars, which is uh, very, very interesting. Um, and then something else I, I found um, uh, uh, intriguing is this supposed distinction between uh, dead and living cultures, um, which caused the sculptures in Leiden to be placed at first in the Museum of Antiquities, um, and which presumably was to some extent used to justify the removal of objects in the first place from their original location. And of course, the uh, problematization of that um, of that concept of, of, of dead cultures. Um, and it, I, I was interested to see that the, um, the, the, the the idea that these beliefs and practices around Hindu Buddhist sculptures, um, the idea that the, these were dead, was already being questioned as early as the uh, as, as the early nineteenth century. So it's it's not something new. Um, it. it um, it reminds me of an anecdote about an American collector who was active in Bangladesh, a Muslim country, in the late 1960s, and he was collecting Buddhist sculpture, and there was one piece which was in a pond in a village, uh, it had fallen into the pond and he wanted to buy it from the villagers, but the villagers didn't want to let it go because they said it would, uh, if they took away the statue, all the fish would die. So very much kind of that belief in, you know, fortune that the ancient statues were, were, were bringing, seen in Bangladesh as well. Um, then you mentioned in 1903, the transfer of the uh, Hindu Buddhist collection to the Museum of Ethnology and the different ways that that could uh, indicate that they were thinking about these collections at the end of this um, uh, universal history of humanity and the, the citing of it within those. Um, and then th this fascinating aspect of the return of the objects in the late 1970s after three decades of negotiation after independence, um, the, um, the, the way that the objects didn't go to their original uh, location, uh, but the Prajnaparamita statue from Singhasari uh, in Eastern Java instead went to the Museum of ja in Jakarta, the National Museum, and of course, uh, the treasures from Lombok also. Um, and I, I want to come back to that, but the, um, the, the shared cultural heritage project from 2003 and the development of, of loans and exhibitions and the, 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 the way that you mentioned that the Dutch foreign minister's attendance was very well received because this was the first time um, a, 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 a Dutch minister had been present in the um, uh, Indonesian Independence Day. Um, and I think that reveals the power, not only the power of um, these activities as uh, cultural diplomacy, as it's often referred to, but also the way that um, uh, political concerns can perhaps influence the way that uh, restitutions and, and cooperations can take place and that in itself may have a uh, perhaps a damaging effect in the way that in the local because of the prestige that might attach to a, nat a national museum um, and you, you stated that the you know the local voice on heritage um, had not been heard and I, I thought that your, your plea for the views of people in the area from which the objects came um, was was very interesting and, and your comments on about how that might be in tension with the views of, of the national uh, authorities. So I, I'd like um, to um, open this up to questions now, but if I may start with a question myself, um, it, um, I, I, I wanted to follow this theme of the local views up and wonder if you could say a little bit more about um, how those can be, you mentioned the idea of doing more research into, into local origins of uh, statues but and, and, and various artifacts but how um the beliefs and attitudes of local people can be taken into account and what as the representative of um academic and museum institutions in the netherlands or elsewhere in the west um how you can approach this um in, in a way obviously it would seem it, it could seem insensitive for a formal colonial power to say to a uh, national government where they should return an object to if an object is restituted from the West to the country of origin. How does one go about approaching that, that sensitive issue? 
And, you know, what ways might there be to negotiate some of these issues? For example, can new technologies like scanning and 3D imaging play a useful role? So I'd be very grateful if you could, you know, sort of say a bit, a bit more about some of those themes. Well, there, there are, in, in, in such issues, there are two extremes, or you do nothing, or you give the object uh, back, you uh, return it and you think, well, it's yours now, um, which is also an extreme point of view, because very often there are no facilities they want to keep or maybe they want to destroy it if that's a traditional way of dealing with an object that's also possible but i think there are many possibilities in in, in between and for instance um, uh, at the end of the project because um, in doing collection research we could identify some highly important objects uh, that were were in storage never seen as important and Going through the archives, uh, we could uh, also a lot of Dutch archives, uh, which was also important for them to get. Uh, um, we could identify some objects, and and there was, for instance, an important Chris, uh, an important uh, ritual dagger, um, that was also seen by the local population as being important, and be, particularly during a particular uh, ritual. And we discussed with the director of the National Museum how to solve this. And that object was given on loan during the ritual. And the local people uh, said, OK, well, this is a good alternative. Then we can use it during our uh, ritual in once in, in a few years. And then the National Muse Museum can take care of it. So that means that the mu museum has to step back a bit from the tra traditional point of view you have to conserve everything. You have to keep everything in good order. Nobody's allowed to touch it, et cetera, et cetera. You can only use gloves to touch it. And that's that's not a point of view that you can keep when you consider working with local populations. So these are possibilities. And uh, um, I th think also not only in Indonesia, <clears throat> but in other parts of the world, that's happening more and more, that the, the museums make a deal with local the local population Saying, well, okay, we recognize that it is originally yours, but wouldn't it be better that we that we take care of it and that you sometimes use it? In the Netherlands, uh, I've encountered a similar problem when I moved from the Museum of Ethnology to the Museum of Ant Antiquities. One of the first things I had to deal with was a village in the southern part of the Netherlands uh, writing a, a very ag aggressive letter you have a Roman helmet, a golden helmet from, from uh, uh, the second or the third centu century AD, uh, and it's found in our village. We want it back. Really very clear. They had the support of the com uh, commission of the queen, the mayor, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And um, that was 100 years. Uh, the, the helmet was found in 1910, and this letter came in in, in 2010. So for them, it was important. And so uh, in the past, uh, museums would put that letter in a drawer and think, well, uh, leave it. It's too complicated. But we said, no, let's talk to them. Let's go there. And it's not very far, the Southern Netherlands from Leiden. So, uh, and it appeared that there were six action groups claiming the helmet. <laughs> So one of the first things I did was, okay, I'm, I'm willing to talk to everybody at the same time. And if one, if I enter the room and one action group is lacking, then I will uh, return to Leiden because I didn't want to choose automatically who, which group to, uh, got the helmet. Uh, so uh, that was a bit uh, a difficult moment, but finally they were all there. And we convinced, they said, yeah, we can, we have a village house and we can make a very good showcase and uh, then it can be on display there. Okay, uh, how many people have the key of the village house? Yeah, the whole village. And so uh, that's the type of discussion and not to just to show to them, or do you think it's a, still think it's a good idea because it's one of the six existing helmets of this kind. It's not only your heritage, it's also Dutch heritage, Euro European heritage. Well, and that, uh, convinced them that we came to an alternative. We gave the helmet on loan for a week. Um, and um, uh, we updated facilities there of the local, uh, local gallery. We gave them our guards. Of course, it costed uh, us a lot of money, but that, uh, 
it didn't matter. And they had the whole week, feasts, reenactments, Roman soldiers walking there in the village, and it was great. So that's also an alternative, sending it back for a week and that thing. But you have to do that in, 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 in consultation with the people. Yes, and 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 in some um, some cases, um, the um, local people may not be happy to receive things only as a loan, uh, and obviously that's some uh, an issue with certain objects like um, uh, 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 treasures looted from Ethiopia in the nineteenth century. That um, you know, or um, with the Parthenon marbles, for example, there are issues about you know that those. <laughs> those but i think we're, we're coming towards the end of the session i just want to know if, would anyone like to ask a question uh before we close yes please. <laughs> you go please um, okay thank you uh thank you for that i have actually lots of questions but um i want yeah, to uh, raise if you we talk later we have other uh, opportunities. Uh, um, so I was also since you used the word again, but I was a bit struck um, why you said that it is um, in the in the two thousands the shared uh, heritage exhibition. Uh, why um, the gesture of lending the Singasari statues uh, to yeah. the museum uh, was showing a sign that the museum was finally taking seriously. And I also wonder uh, why um, you seem to suggest that um, helmets from from the Roman Empire or whatever are comparable to uh, statues that have their origin in the temples um, and that were obviously taken is a form of looting. I mean, yeah. Well, the the the, hel <laughs> the helmet was not uh, was not a helmet to use to be used in warfare. That was also a helmet that that had a kind of ritual purpose it, it, it's a very light uh, silver uh, gilded silver helmet so it could never have been used in warfare but but that's another thing uh, having the singers you you mean why not giving back to singers that you that was <laughs> yeah um well the, the easy answer there was never a formal request to give it back um but the the more complicated answer is that we we did it it was discussed at a certain moment and um we we have really weighed the the, the pros and the contrast of starting that process uh, and finally both the indonesian partners and myself said let's not do it because we were very much afraid that the project would be hijacked by by politicians that there would be an enormous uh, emotional reaction on, on the various sides and uh, the whole project was financed by by ministries uh, and uh, we were very much afraid that we had a very good uh, relation among mu museum colleagues and we were really afraid what the effects would be if indonesia would formally request the objects back uh, is that an answer it's also politics eh? it's pure it's pure politics I don't um, exclude the fact that there will be sooner, sooner or later a return also because the situation has changed a lot. But the, at that time, the relationship was so sens sensitive that uh, we thought it's better not, not to discuss it. And uh, yeah, it never reached the, stage, the, the status of a formal request. They did inform informally of course also very polite uh, but uh, we, we finally finally found it better that uh, the time had not yet come thank you very much Sorry. i know you're not convinced of this answer but <laughs> thank you unfortunately we, we have um, run out of time but i hope we'll be able to continue this conversation uh, in the break and, and throughout the day but thank you so much it was a really illuminating talk and uh, really fascinating on this so very very lively topic um 
that we're all engaged with in various different ways. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.